many years ago, when I was a resident in training in psychiatry, I accepted a, for a patient a very charming, intelligent, handsome, silver-haired gentleman who had had many, many admissions to the hospital for alcohol detoxification. He was obviously a chronic alcoholic, but with his wit, his intelligence, I thought surely I could help him get well. And my assessment of him was that he was depressed and he drank because he was depressed. This gentleman, we'll call him Tom, saw me four days a week, one hour a day for two years, 50 weeks out of each year. At the end of my time in training when I was due to leave, I passed Tom on to another therapist to continue his treatment. By the way, during those two years with me, the longest he ever stayed sober was some six months and he had had many other admissions for detox during those two years. The other therapist took Tom on. I observed the initial sessions through a one-way mirror with the other therapist because I wasn't going to give up on Tom. And I realized very quickly as I listened to him with the other therapist, the new therapist, that all I had accomplished in two years with Tom was provide Tom with better reasons to drink than Tom could ever have thought of on his own. Tragically, just three months later, Tom died from his alcoholism, from a ruptured spleen that occurred in a bar fight. His death made me realize that I must be doing something wrong. To have worked that long, that intensely, with that intelligent of a human being, and to have them die anyway was extremely frustrating. That led me into the decision to try to find out what is this thing called alcoholism? What's it all about? And I started studying the literature and talking to people around the country who had some success of dealing with alcoholism, attending Alcoholics Anonymous meetings to find out what happened in those, etc. And through this, if you want, study of alcoholism, I became very, very invested in developing the idea of the disease concept of alcoholism. The very simple idea that alcoholism was not a symptom of some other disease, like I had said with Tom that it was a symptom of his depression, but that alcoholism is a primary disease, a disease all of its own, that has its own cause, its own signs and symptoms, its own history, its own outcome, and therefore probably should have its own specific kinds of treatment. Since that time, I've really kind of dedicated myself to looking into this issue of alcoholism, the disease, for the better part of my professional career. Now, I think the first place to start with this topic is if we're going to call it a disease, we need to try to figure out what is a disease. On the blackboard back here, I've written two definitions of the word disease. The first comes from Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, and it basically states that a disease is anything that interferes with the ability of the human to function normally. Well, that's certainly true of alcoholism. I mean, if you think about the history of an alcoholic, the intoxications, the neglect of duties, et cetera, et cetera. It obviously interferes with their ability to function. But that's a very oh, almost philosophical definition. And it certainly didn't convince me in my studies that alcoholism was a disease because it's just too broad a definition. Medically, we're much more specific. Scientifically, we're much more specific with what we call a disease, what qualifies something to be considered a disease. And here, from one of the more common medical dictionaries, I've abbreviated a definition, and it basically states it is a definite morbid process with a characteristic chain of symptoms whose cause and the natural history of which may be known or unknown. Wow, what's that all mean? Well, it's really not that complicated. A morbid process is what Webster's was talking about. A morbid process is something going on in a human being's life that causes them to not function the way they're supposed to function. So that's, that part of it would agree with Webster's. The highlight of this definition is this phrase, characteristic chain of symptoms. That means that a disease is some process where those people who suffer from it have certain problems, certain symptoms, certain things that take them to the doctor in common, and that these symptoms are much like the links of a chain. They tend to occur in a certain order, in a certain pattern. For instance, in the diabetic, certainly diabetes is a disease.
frequent symptoms that might take the person to the doctor would be complaints of fatigue of excessive thirst and excessive urination and any physician worth their salt when he heard those three symptoms would automatically start a workup a study of blood a study of urine and ask other questions to make the diagnosis of diabetes because of the characteristic chain of symptoms now what's also important about this definition is whether or not we know what causes the disease is irrelevant to whether we consider it a disease and that should be obvious but it frequently isn't but if you think about it the two leading causes of death in this country are heart attack stroke blood vessel disease and cancer and we really don't know the cause for any of those diseases we have ideas we know cholesterol may or may not be important we know certain chemicals smoking etc may or may not be important with cancer but we really don't know the exact cause why this cell becomes cancerous this cell, cell doesn't so cause is not important in whether we consider it a disease or not and likewise the natural history meaning what happens if you don't treat it what's its natural course if, if it just goes on by itself whether we know what that is or not is not really relevant to whether we consider it a disease in today's world we're dealing with a new infectious disease called AIDS and while we've learned a lot in the last five to ten years about AIDS we still don't know its full natural course we don't really know if everybody who has that virus in their body is going to end up dying from it or not only time and further study will tell us that so again while it's nice to know that about a disease and is useful in diagnosis and treatment it's not essential to whether we consider something a disease what's essential is that it must have a characteristic chain of symptoms now even though as physicians we call ourselves practitioners of the healing arts and I believe medicine is more art than it is science in many ways most doctors like to think of ourselves as scientists and as scientists we really struggle with accepting something as a disease unless we have a better idea of the cause we like to be able to look under the microscope and say ah there's the little vicious microbe that's causing this person to get illness there's the bacteria there's the virus that causes tuberculosis that causes leprosy or whatever and when we've gotten that far with our understanding of a disease it becomes easier for us to accept it as a true illness historically in medicine or in our culture and in our society when we've looked at the alcoholic we've looked at them as someone who has a moral problem or a weak will kind of problem after all all the alcoholic himself or herself had to do was stop drinking or cut down on their drinking and it was very difficult to accept that this person's problem drinking too much alcohol could have some kind of an underlying disease process but I believe it does and I think if we look at how medicine decides something's a disease and approaches a disease I can prove that to you today now as I've already mentioned to you one of the things that medicine looks at when we're studying a disease is what is its cause and most important in deciding whether it is not a disease or not what are the symptoms we like to know the natural history and part of that is the outcome let me explain that briefly why is that important well some diseases go away by themselves you really don't need to do anything the common cold the natural history of that is you're going to be down in the dumps you're going to be uh, stuffy and cough and runny nose for a week if you go to a physician you get decongestants antihistamines cough syrup you're going to be having all those symptoms for about seven days so maybe we don't need to do anything maybe that illness can just be taken care of by itself and lastly of course we're interested in is there or is there not treatment for a disease that's important from the humanistic point of view but it's obviously not important in whether something is a disease because we still have many many illnesses that we see every day for which we have no treatment or very poor treatment at best such as some of the more advanced types of cancer let's get to this right here the symptoms the definition said a morbid process with a chain of symptoms does alcoholism have a characteristic chain of symptoms my goodness yes we've known for decades that alcoholics have an awful lot of symptoms in common be they men women 
white, black, yellow, red, young, old. There are some differences between those various groups, but there's some common characteristics. Now, I don't have time to go through all of the known symptoms of alcoholism. There's a hundred or more. But over here, I've represented in a sort of a simple graphic way the fact that we not only know what the symptoms of alcoholism are, we know them so well that we're able to divide the disease into stages. Now, we use fancier medical terms for this, but normally I like to refer to it as early stage alcoholism, middle stage, and late stage. Now, this whole thing, whether we're talking early, middle, or late, is a description of what we call chronic alcoholism. It's just how far along has the disease progressed. Some of the characteristic early stage symptoms that I think are highly relevant and worth mentioning at this point, drinking for relief, whether that's relief from physical pain, emotional pain, social pain, whatever. You drink for relief. You have an increased tolerance. You get a reputation of being able to drink more than your peer group, than your colleagues. You can drink anybody under the table. DWI, very significant early symptom because it's an area in which we should be identifying alcoholics and we don't do that well. The blackout, a period of amnesia that occurs while you're under the influence of alcohol. It may last for a few minutes, may last for days. Doesn't mean you've passed out, just means you don't remember some of the things that occurred while you were drinking. In the middle stage is where we see all the social deterioration going on. The family problems, the marital problems, job problems, financial problems, legal problems, ethical, moral deterioration. It's where the, it, the alcoholic frequently becomes identified because of problems that occur in these various social areas. It's only in the late stages of the disease where you get what I call the body rot stage of alcoholism. That's where the body literally starts to fall apart. It may be the liver, it may be the stomach, the pancreas, the brain, the nervous system. It could be almost any organ system in the body or more than one organ system that's affected. Ironically, medicine has for a long time been very reluctant to call someone an alcoholic until they at least showed some body rot when in fact those are late symptoms of a disease that at least in the typical adult alcoholic has been present for 15 to 20 years. To go from the top of that chart to the bottom of that chart in the typical adult alcoholic is a one to two decade experience. So basically we have been letting people suffer from a progressive illness until they're in the very late stages. That doesn't really make much sense to us. Now, let me restate something. The symptoms are there, they're well known, they're reliable, and they're predictable. And that fact alone qualifies alcoholism in the strictest scientific sense of the word as a disease process. Now, let's go back to some of these other areas, though, that medicine's interested in. Cause we're going to talk about in a few minutes. The symptoms we've described some of. The natural history of this illness is as long as the alcoholic drinks, they only get worse. They only go down this chart, even if they're receiving a lot of treatment. Tom, my patient, when I was a young resident, got hundreds of hours of treatment from me and from many other health care professionals who took care of his physical problems and injuries, etc., etc. But he only got worse because he continued to drink. The outcome for most alcoholics in this country today is death, just like Tom died. Violent, unpredictable death. Automobile accidents, in his case a bar fight, falling asleep in a drunken stupor with a cigarette burning and setting your house on fire, your bed on fire. Of course, many do die from physical problems such as liver disease and such. But the outcome, unfortunately, for most is death. And the reason is they don't get treatment. Is there treatment? Indeed there is. Statistics clearly show that if we identify an alcoholic in the early or middle stages of, of their disease process and get them into treatment for alcoholism as a primary disease, recovery rate should be in the 60 to 70 percent range. The tragedy is we let so many people die from this illness, the third leading cause of death in this country, without offering them good quality treatment that could stop this disease process dead in its tracks. 
Now, the American Medical Association decided alcoholism was a disease officially way back in 1956, based upon the fact it had the chain of symptoms that was characteristic of a disease process. That led to extensive research looking for are there differences between social drinkers and the way they handle beverage alcohol and the alcoholic. And nothing really could be found of any major significance or that couldn't be explained just by the fact that they had damaged their body by drinking. But in the last 10 to 20 years, major advances have gone on in what we call the neurosciences, the ability to study that extremely complex organ in the brain and the chemical and electrical processes that go on there. And with the development of this new technology, some absolutely amazing discoveries have come about in the field of alcoholism and other chemical dependencies. Back in the 1970s, some biochemical researchers in Texas wrote some papers stating that, hey, we believe that a human being, an alcoholic, is capable of taking alcohol, the beverage alcohol that was being consumed, and literally through a very complex chemical process, turn it into a heroin-like substance right inside of the brain where it would do the most damage. This led to a phenomenal amount of research throughout the world into whether or not that indeed could go on, whether or not it was going on, and whether or not it might explain some of the behavior that we see in the typical, quote, alcoholic. Now, in order to explain this, I have to go over a little basic body chemistry with you. The alcoholic metabolizes or burns up alcohol exactly the same way as the social drinker does. When we drink alcohol, the body gets rid of it very rapidly, at the rate of about one drink per hour. The alcohol is first turned into a chemical substance called acetaldehyde. This is a deadly poison. It's closely related to a chemical called formaldehyde, which is embalming fluid. And if this were to build up to any major level in our system, we would get violently ill very quickly from alcohol. And indeed, if it got high enough in our bloodstream, it would kill us. But almost as rapidly as it's made, it is converted into a chemical called acetic acid. Many of you know that as vinegar. And then through a complex chemical reaction in the body, the acetic acid ends up as carbon dioxide and water, which we get rid of through our lungs and through our urine primarily. Now, what was discovered through the 1970s, after the original work was published in Texas, was that the alcoholic had a unique ability inside of the brain cell known as the neuron to take some of this acetaldehyde and have it attach itself to a group of chemicals that are found in all human brain. The human brain has a series of chemicals that are known as transmitters. They're called that because they, they help to transmit messages from one brain cell to another. They're essential for normal brain function. It was discovered that this acetaldehyde, which remember comes from alcohol, was able to combine in the neurons, the brain cells of alcoholics, with these chemicals we all have called transmitters, and through a very complicated series of chemical reactions, form a group of chemicals that are known as the TIQs. That stands for tetrahydroisoquinolones. It's a little easy to remember TIQs. Well, so what? Well, these excited researchers tremendously because we knew something about these chemicals. We had found them in the brains of heroin addicts. These substances, these TIQ chemicals, chemically are very closely related to heroin. Indeed, when you shoot heroin into a human being, most of it turns into a drug known as morphine, but a small amount of it turns into TIQs. So suddenly we had a linkage here. We had a linkage between opiate addiction, heroin, morphine, Demerol, codeine, that group of pain-killing drugs, and alcohol. And it appeared to be rather unique to the alcoholic. Now, even more importantly, as the early research went on in the 70s and early 80s, it was discovered if we took these TIQ chemicals, which were capable of synthesizing or making in the test tube, and we put them into the brain of various animals, rats, mice, monkeys, even small pigs, that we could take animals that normally would not touch alcohol 
If you offered them a choice between a dilute solution of alcohol and pure water, they would always choose the water. If you put these TIQs into their brain, into the spinal fluid that bathes the brain, you could convert them instantaneously into animals that preferred alcohol over water. So we appeared to be able to chemically take non-alcoholic animals, and indeed, by putting these chemicals into their brain, that alcoholics were believed to make from alcohol in their brain, we could turn these animals into alcoholics, and their behavior would look an awful lot like the behavior we saw in the human alcoholic. A very, very exciting finding. Well, since that discovery occurred, other exciting things have gone on in the field of neurochemistry. A whole new group of transmitters were discovered. And these you may have heard of. They're now labeled under one name, the endorphins. These are the body's own naturally occurring opiate transmitters. They, they fit into receptors in the areas of our brain where drugs like heroin, morphine, and Demerol fit. And we've discovered that if you have enough of these endorphins in your body, you feel well. If for some reason you don't have enough of these endorphins, you feel very depressed, you feel very anxious, you feel very irritable, moody, a very unpleasant state of being. Some exciting research, again ironically, going on at Texas, at the University of Texas in San Antonio, by Dr. Ken Bloom, has tied together these new transmitters, the endorphins, with the TIQs, which have an endorphin-like activity. Now, on the blackboard behind me, I've tried to illustrate in a simplified form what goes on in brain cells known as neurons. This is one neuron. This is another neuron. You have to understand a little bit about brain anatomy here. We have tens of billions of neurons in our brain, so we're talking about a very complex system. They do not touch each other. In between each neuron, there is a space. For the brain to function normally, this neuron has to be able to talk to that neuron. It does so by making chemicals known as transmitters that we referred to earlier. Over here, we have a neuron which is making endorphins as a transmitter. These are, again, remember, our body's own natural opiate substance. It releases these opiate substances, the endorphins. They float across this space, and they literally fit into what are known as endorphin receptors in this neuron, much like two pieces of a jigsaw puzzle fit together. When you have enough of these endorphin receptors filled up, you have a feeling of feeling very fine, of feeling good, healthy, happy. So this would be a condition we call opioid adequacy. Now, let's talk about what happens in alcoholism. The alcoholic starts to drink. They start to manufacture the TIQs that we talked about a few minutes ago, where some of the acetaldehyde gets converted to TIQs instead of carbon dioxide water. The TIQs enter the brain, and they fit in the opiate endorphin receptor, and they fill it up. When they get filled up, the brain is, if you want, the mother of conservation. She says, well, wait a minute now. I've got all my opiate receptors filled. All my endorphin receptors are filled. I don't need to keep making endorphins. I can shut down my endorphin production line for a while because I've got enough of them. So this cell, as we've illustrated here, with a smaller amount of endorphins in it, has stopped making endorphins. But you still have a feeling of, I feel fine, but it is a false feel fine. It's being caused by the presence of these TIQs that you're making from alcohol. Well, I don't care how dedicated an alcoholic or how professional an alcoholic you are, sooner or later, you have to stop drinking. You just get physically sick, you run out of money, you got to go to work, you get admitted to a treatment center, something happens. You end up not being able to get to your alcohol. So now the alcohol has gone. I'm not manufacturing more TIQs, and I start to have some empty endorphin receptors because I'm not making those TIQs anymore. 
I don't have my own natural endorphins around because this cell's production line had been shut down. It doesn't have any, it doesn't have enough of them in storage. So now I end up with a situation where a lot of my endorphin receptors are empty. And there is solid evidence building today, again, particularly in Dr. Bloom's laboratory in San Antonio, that when you have this deficiency of certain endorphins, you have a state of craving. You want that drink. You can't really get it off your mind. It also leads to a very good understanding, in my mind, of the clinical thing we see all the time, and that is loss of control. You know, ironically, even today, when alcoholics go to a doctor, even if they have some body rot, they're liable to be told by that doctor, well, what you really need to do is cut down, which is asking the alcoholic to do something that's physically impossible. They're in this state if they stop drinking. They're very unhappy. They're depressed. They're anxious. They're tense. They crave alcohol. And what you're telling them is, okay, what I want you to do is drink just enough alcohol to start filling these receptors up with TIQs. And that's going to make you feel a little bit better. But I don't want you to drink enough to fill them all up so you really feel good. Ridiculous. No human being alive is going to be able to do that which is why we still have to tell alcoholics today in modern medicine, in the, in the best treatment available, you can't drink. That advice hasn't changed. But at least now we can hopefully give them some understanding that the reason they can't drink is not a lack of willpower or self-discipline, not a lack of morals. It's a basic biochemical defect. When they drink, they make these TIQs, shuts down the production of the endorphins, and an opioid inadequacy state will exist when they stop drinking, which is going to lead to craving, which is going to lead to relapse and continued drinking. A very physical phenomenon. Now, interestingly enough, we've actually carried this one step further in research. It has now been shown that one of the things the endorphins are capable of doing is going to an area of our brain called the pleasure center. And when they get to the pleasure center of the brain, they cause a different group of transmitters to be released that causes us to feel pleasure, to feel good. Ironically, those are the same transmitters that are released when one does cocaine or amphetamine-like drugs. So what we're doing here is on a basic biochemical level, we're starting to tie together all kinds of addictions. Opiate addiction, heroin, you shoot heroin, you have TIQs from the heroin, it's going to cause an endorphin deficiency in cravings. Alcoholism, you take the acetaldehyde mate from alcohol, convert some of it into TIQs, endorphin deficiency, craving. Cocaineism, stimulants, the opposite, an upper versus a downer, and you end up depleting some of the same transmitters in the brain that ultimately get affected when you drink, it just takes a more complex chain, a little longer to do it. A very basic biochemical difference. You know, medicine is known for decades, maybe even centuries, that alcoholism ran in families. And for the longest period of time, we explain that as an environmental thing. You grew up in the home with a bunch of drinking, in a society with a bunch of drinking. There was a good chance you were going to be a big drinker like your parents were. But in the last 20 years, there have been over 800 published studies that conclusively show alcoholism is a highly inheritable genetic illness. The original work came right out of Washington University in St. Louis, done primarily in the Scandinavian countries. There continues to be some major research being done by Washington University and many other places, as well as the Scandinavian countries, which repeatedly document that genetics is the single most important factor in determining whether or not someone will become an alcoholic if they choose to drink. Now this has actually led to research going on in laboratories like Dr. Bloom's in San Antonio where they are able to order from laboratory suppliers different mice that are either genetically predisposed to become alcoholic if you want a born alcoholic mouse and some that are genetically predisposed to absolutely detest alcohol. And if we'll turn to the monitor here for a minute, we have some uh, 
scenes here of our non-alcoholic mouse, Linda, the gray mouse we're seeing here. You can see she's rather quiet, rather, actually rather timid and shy individual. Her genetic background is such that if you offer her a very weak solution of alcohol or pure water, she always chooses the water, actually abhors or hates any alcohol that would be offered to her, and she really won't touch it. If you'll watch this black mouse, uh, who is genetically predisposed, now he, he really hasn't had anything to drink here, don't get me wrong. This mouse has not yet been exposed to alcohol, but if you were to expose him to alcohol, if you offered him a choice of an alcoholic beverage or water, he would choose the alcohol and would drink to heavy intoxication. If you're watching, he's much more hyper, much more uh, inquisitive. He runs around the cage. Uh, the lab workers would say that this is a mean little mouse uh, compared to his spouse, Linda, the non-alcoholic mouse who tends to be rather quiet, rather laid back, shy, and timid. This uh, little black mouse, her mate, is, is quite, quite active. And this is one of their children, their son. They were bred together, the non-alcoholic mouse, Linda, the black mouse here who's alcoholic, and this son, therefore, is a combination of the two, and believe it or not, runs a four to five times greater chance of becoming alcoholic than if Linda had made it with another non-alcoholic mouse. One of the interesting genetic findings, research findings in our genetic studies, using identical twins, one of whom stays in the biological home with an alcoholic mother or father, and the other is adopted and lives in a non-alcoholic home, never knew the biological parents, is that we're beginning to identify different types, even, of genetic alcoholism. And one of the most common types is the son of an alcoholic father, and that son will run a risk four to five times above normal of developing alcoholism by the time they reach their middle-aged years. Put all this together, and what do we really have? What we're saying is we have overwhelming evidence that the alcoholic, in the vast majority of cases, is a person who was born genetically predisposed to alcoholism. Once they started to drink, because of defects in brain chemistry, or at least we have to say changes in brain chemistry, they're able to manufacture substances called TIQs in excessive amounts. Those TIQs infect the endorphin systems of the brain, which affect the way they feel, which leads to craving, which leads to alcoholism. Now, even more interesting, many researchers have demonstrated that there are other ways to lower your endorphin levels and feel bad. One way is drink a lot of alcohol for a long time. That leads to certain nutritional deficiencies and to certain basic changes in body chemistry that will ultimately lead to an inability to make endorphins in your brain. A third way to lower the brain endorphin levels is to put somebody under severe stress for a long period of time. This was found in some studies done on POW victims from Vietnam. So really, it's kind of interesting. Clinically, we see that. We see the alcoholic who has a strong family history and who seemed to lose control over their drinking fairly rapidly and had a very rapid and progressive disease. We see the alcoholic who drank a lot of alcohol for a long time with control, didn't really experience any problems with it, and then after many, many years and decades of drinking, suddenly seems to lose control. And then we also see the alcoholic who begins to drink heavily to deal with severe long-term chronic stress. But let me emphasize a point here. Undoubtedly, the most common type of alcoholic we see clinically and in research is the alcoholic who is genetically predisposed, who makes tetrahydroisoquinolones, TIQs, in their brain, that affects the endorphin system, that affects their ability to experience pleasure and enjoy life in a normal and natural way. Now, let's go back to what is a disease. It's something that has a characteristic chain of symptoms. We've known alcoholism's had that for decades. 
But believe it or not, we're also making great strides, as I've tried to illustrate here today briefly, with understanding the underlying genetic biochemical defect that sets someone up to become an alcoholic. Why is that important information? It's important because it should say to the alcoholic and to those who are affected by living with the alcoholic, and yes, to those who treat the alcoholic, hey, it's not their fault. They just happen to pick their parents poorly. They have a genetic biochemical difference that makes them react in a unique fashion to the drug alcohol. So while it's not their fault, they deserve to be treated like any other human being who suffers from a progressive, horribly, horribly incapacitating and often fatal disease. At the same time, once they know they have this disease, once they know they are alcoholic, and they know about this chemistry and the fact that they are indeed different and unique in the way they handle the drug alcohol, it becomes very much their responsibility to do those things they need to do to keep this disease in remission, to keep it under control. And so far, the only way we know to do that is don't take in any alcohol, then you won't have any acid aldehyde, then you won't have any of these TIQs, and then you won't have any of the endorphin deficiencies, and then you can go about leading a normal, healthy, happy life. Thank you very much.